Many have heard or made reference to a biblical phenomenon called the wisdom of Job. And many refer to it as the patience of Job. But Job is, in fact, the first book in a section of the Old Testament known as the wisdom literature, the wisdom of Israel, which includes the Book of Wisdom in Sirach, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, Proverbs, and the Psalms. It's one of the longest books in that series, over 40 chapters, and it's one of the most ancient writings of the Scriptures. Scriptures were not written in sequence. Genesis was not the first book of the Bible that was written. But Job is one of the earliest, so early that it's sometimes in some places difficult to translate because the language is so ancient and so dead. But Job is an intriguing story because the wisdom of Job addresses a question that, let's face it, modern generations think we are the only ones who've thought of this question. But this ancient question is basically, in a nutshell, why do bad things happen to good people? And Job, in many ways, turns the conventional wisdom of his day upside down. Because it was believed that if something bad happened to a person, it was because God was punishing them. And that, too, is a possibility. That You see reflections that the Jews have on their own experience, and they look back on some negative experiences, and they say, yes, God was chastising us for our sins. That's entirely possible. But the presumption automatically that a bad thing happens means the person was wicked, Job confronts that notion and in many ways does not answer the question but rather accentuates the wisdom of God, accentuates the the actions of God to really emphasize the point that we will never fully understand. Job, of course, was a wealthy man and he had flocks, a family, children, And at one point, God allows all of that to be taken away from him. Satan is the one he allows to have it taken, but the understanding of Satan in the book of Job is different than what we understand it now. Satan is a tester, testing the resolve of Job's faith. He says, well, of course Job has faith in you. Everything's going well for him. But if you take all his possessions, he'll curse you to your face. Then later he says, well, you take away his health, and he'll curse you to your face. And Job remains stalwart. God allows everything to be taken, including Job's health, everything except his life. And while people around him, including his wife, are saying, curse God and die, Job remains faithful in his belief in God. And there's that very famous passage in the book of Job. Naked I came forth from the world, naked I shall go back. The Lord has given and the Lord will take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Easier said than done, I can imagine. But as he's visited by three friends of his who sit and talk with him in his misery and his squalor, he's got sores all over his body, his health is uh, completely been ravished. And the gist of the book of Job is this conversation between these four, the three friends and Job's response. And the basic point of the three friends is you must have done something for God to strike you like this. You must be guilty of something. And Job maintains his innocence. He maintains his innocence throughout this whole ordeal. But finally, toward the climax of the book of Job, after chapter upon chapter of this discussion, written in very poetic form, poetic for the ancient language, you kind of lose the the rhyming or the the, uh, cadences in, uh, in English, Job finally stands in defiance of God, basically defies God to tell him what he did to deserve this. And as the book comes to a close, God answers Job. And what does he say? He doesn't answer Job's question. He basically says, Where were you when I created the earth? Where does the wind come from? Where does the sea have its origin? Tell me if you know. Is the Lord to endure comments by the critic? In the end, the wisdom of Job is not in patience, but what leads to that patience, and that is faith. 
God's answer to Job is basically, in a nutshell, I don't require you to understand why all this happened. All you need to understand is that I understand why this happened. Which can be unsettling for any of us, because we're in an age in which we like to know. We have the internet, we have answers at the tips of our fingers, and if we don't have the answers, we'll create one. We don't like to have no answers to the drudgery. And as Job says in our first reading today, is not life on earth a drudgery? And sometimes we just have to simply endure that and understand that. And that God is not going to give us all the answers all the time. And that sounds harsh. But in the end, that is the basic essence of the faith that we profess. From the very beginning with Abraham. Abraham came from a pagan culture in which the pagan understanding of the cosmos was everything is a cycle, everything repeats itself, there's no point in understanding history because everything's the same, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the moon has its cycles, we die, we come back to life, and a reincarnation, it's understandable why that would be a pagan understanding. And then comes this new divinity that reveals itself to Abraham, and what does he tell Abraham? Go off to a land that I will show you. Well, where is it? I'll tell you when you get there. I will make of you a great nation whose numbers will number the stars of the sky. Well, how am I to know that this is to happen? Because I'm God and I've told you it's going to be so. In the ancient pagan notion, the cycles were understandable. The cycles were learnable. The cycles were predictable. Even the divinities were manipulated. You were able to manipulate them through the sacrifices, the cultic practices, because if you understand the cycle, then you can predict it, you can know it, you can even perhaps manipulate it. But the one thing, and perhaps the first thing, that Abraham had to come to grips with in this new divinity is that he could never completely know him. And certainly could not predict him or manipulate him. He had to have something that was not a part of religious cultic practices in the pagan world. He had to have Faith. Faith in the word that this divinity had given him. Faith that this word would eventually be fulfilled. And he would not have a passive relationship as they do with the cosmic notions of divinity, but an active one with this divinity that would require faith. And a God who's not going to tell him everything, but require a simple but radical thing called faith. This is the same faith that the early martyrs had to endure. What was the faith of the early church? Jesus is Messiah and he is risen. We are saved. And yet we're enduring this horrendous persecution at the hands of a pagan empire. The book of Revelation actually addresses that. When the fifth seal is peeled, John the seer says that he hears from underneath the altar in heaven the cry of the martyrs those who have been slaughtered for their faith in God. And they ask in the typical prayer of lamentation, how long, O Lord, must we endure this? And the answer was very simple. Until the quota of those who have borne witness as you have has been fulfilled. Well, thanks, Lord. Try not to encourage us too much. But what is it saying? Is it saying that God is making the Romans kill them? No. But what it does drive home is in the midst of the suffering of the early church, the people who are suffering, and certainly the people who are dying, don't see the purpose, don't know what the future holds, but they were stalwart in the notion that God had a purpose to this. We look back on history and can understand that purpose. And we can say the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, but the martyrs at that time were not saying that as the lions were eating them. They didn't know what that purpose was, and they could only have faith that God had an understanding as to why this was happening. And all they needed to know was that God had a purpose, and that should be enough. God eventually revealed it to us later on in history, but certainly not at the time they were going through it. That, too, is the wisdom of Job. We, too, have experiences in our own lives. I can certainly say as a priest, I see them in the lives of people. Even recently, uh, I visited a family of a parishioner here, 
and I anointed his 10-year-old son not 45 minutes before he died. I couldn't help but think of today's first reading. I'm 47. How many here are, let's just say, older than 47? And here a 10-year-old dies very suddenly. Is not life on this earth a drudgery? Some of you might have similar experiences, whether it be economic difficulty, family uh, difficulty, health issues, the loss of a loved one, the loss of someone so young, the loss of a newborn. Who knows? And we often ask that question, why? And as Job asks, why do bad things happen to good people? When you think about it, so many people's faith is based upon that question. Their faith hinges upon that question. How can there be a God when children suffer? How can there be a God when there are people in the Middle East who are suffering because of their faith? Their whole notion of the existence of God is based on whether we are living bubbly lives or whether people are suffering. Job, from early, early on, grapples with that question. And it's an unsettling, it's a disquieting wisdom. Because God never answers Job's question. But he gives him a deep perspective with regard to faith. God will sometimes give us answers. But not always. And sometimes the only answer we need to settle for as a people who profess to have a faith is that God does not require us to understand everything. But with full faith in God, understand that God understands. God has that purpose. We pray that perhaps one day we may understand that purpose. But the wisdom of Job is, I don't require you to understand. All you need to understand and take consolation is, is that God, in the end, understands.